everyone. My name is Don. Guess where I... <laughs> Didn't I do this last year? So yeah, I'm back here in Tokyo, Japan, covering what is the largest board gaming convention in the country. Let's go inside, take a look, and see what it's all about. Actually, before we step inside, let me walk you through the morning leading up to the game market. So I'm staying at a friend's house this year, and it's an hour away from the convention site. And what did I tell you last year? Do you remember my advice? I had to walk for 27 minutes before I got to the entrance doors. Craziness. This is what it looked like inside. My advice? Don't arrive 7 minutes before a convention starts. So, did I follow my advice this year? Of course I did. I made sure that this year I was going to arrive at that convention site an hour and a half early. And guess what? I did it. In fact, I wound up arriving 15 minutes late, and that was just to the station. I still had to walk another 15 minutes to get to the entrance doors. Why did that happen? Trains! Look at this, you see this? I'm standing on the train when suddenly it comes to a screeching halt and the whole train line shuts down for 45 minutes. I'm just standing inside the train and there's nothing I can do. I can't even go to the bathroom and the train is right next to the platform. Just pull up a little more so people can get out. But no, we all waited there in silent agony. Finally, the train starts moving again. But now they're forcing everyone to switch train lines which means I gotta figure out a new route. Here's a picture I took of the subway map system. This is just the subway. Take a moment and Google JR East Railway Lines. Do you see that nightmare of a map too? Now you might be saying, well that certainly is a complex railway system that Tokyo has, but that's not even including the 55 other train lines serving Tokyo. So at that point, I got a bit mixed around. After a bit of deliberation and a lot of rushing, I finally do arrive at the Tokyo Big Sight train station. Instead of going through the front door like last year, there were guides on the road telling us to enter in through the back doors. So, I'm walking with the other late stragglers, yeah, this guy over here gets it, and at long last, I get to the entrance, and the show can now begin. So, Tokyo Game Market. The big change this year is that it became a two-day convention, which is great to see. It shows that the market is growing, and more people are becoming aware of the hobby. But what is the Tokyo Game Market all about? I haven't been to other gaming conventions, but I feel that of all the conventions out there, you will not see one that supports the independent designer more thoroughly. You see, crowdfunding still hasn't taken off in Japan like it has in Western countries, so designers are still using traditional means to sell their games. And the game market is the biggest opportunity for them to do that. What kind of games are we talking about? Well, let's take a look and just see how indie this place can get. Wing Pirates. No, no, Wing Spirits. Spirits. Yeah, now this, this is why you come to Game Market. You need an indie game, then you need Wing Spirits. You put the ball under your fingers and let it rip. If the ball comes back without touching any of the barriers, then you get to take the token at the point where your ball made it to. Yup. So obviously, you need to drop everything you're doing right now, call Japan, and put this game into your collection. Why are you still watching me talk about it on YouTube? Oh my gosh, have I seriously ruined the rest of this video by showing this game first? Wing Spirits, ladies and gentlemen. Get it while it's still hot. Well, if you're still around, let's keep going. Tokyo Highway. This is a challenging dexterity game that has both you and an opponent creating separate highways. When you create a highway, it has to be one stone higher or lower than the one you are connecting it to. If you create a highway over or under your opponent's highway, then you can put a car on your own highway, scoring you a point. The yellow stones are for junctions and can be used to make your road split in two different directions. Trying to get my highways over and under my opponents while still keeping them far away so they couldn't score off of my roads was indeed a challenging but enjoyable task. This is a two-player only game and it had my hand shaking by the end. Zombooger. I'm always curious when I see things like this in Japan. This is a Japanese product for Japanese people and it's called Zombooger. It's a play on English words. Do Japanese people even get it? 
Well, the Japanese word for zombie actually is zombie, but the word for booger is hanakuso. Share that one with your friends next time. And I know for a fact that booger is not a common English word that most Japanese people know. Anyway, yeah, the game. It's basically a rock, paper, scissors style game, but your cards have the symbol that you're gonna play. Everyone reveals their card at the same time, and if one person wins in the rock, paper, scissors match, then they get the points. If there is a draw, and in a four-player game of rock, paper, scissors, you can guess how often that will happen, then the oldest zombie played will win. You can also choose to maybe play a booger card on your turn. If you choose to do so, instead of revealing the card, you say Zombooger, and all other players have the chance to call your bluff. The best thing this game has going for it is the artwork. It's super cute, and the parodies on real-life people are a lot of fun to see, but I need a game with a little more substance. But how would I go about finding that game? There are literally hundreds of independent games on display at the game market, and only a handful of them are bigger titles with any marketing to back them up. How do you know which games to take a look at? Well, let's talk about the catalogs. The catalogs are actually your ticket into this place. There were two separate catalogs this year, one for each day of the convention. And on top of that, there was this third catalog with nothing but ads for each designer with a table. I actually bought all three of these catalogs at my local game store in Kyoto, hundreds of miles away from Tokyo. I thought that was pretty cool. Even better though, the store gave me 10% coupons for their booth at the convention. I was pleasantly surprised by that one. So I'm looking through these catalogs and I find this page talking about the Game Market Awards for 2017. So I thought to myself, alright, I should probably take a look and see what these are all about. So let's do this. First up, 8-Bit Mockup. This game won the Best Game of the Year award, and if you've ever played Carcassonne or Karuba, you will see a lot of similarities here. Each player gets the same 25 tiles to build their world, and a lead player will draw 20 of these tiles at random. You have to lay your tile in your tableau by matching it with all the surrounding tiles, and try to connect as many circles as possible. When a tile with a red number is drawn, all players at the table can take a monument and put it anywhere in their world. The areas where you put your monuments in are what score you points at the end of the game, with each circle scoring one point. Furthermore, if you are able to close these sections off with the monument inside, then this area will score you double points. Most points obviously wins you the game. I found this to be a fun, light-hearted game, and if you know someone who always gets confused from the farmer scoring mechanism in Carcassonne, then this might be a great alternative for them. Alright, next up is Kids Game of the Year. That one goes to kitties, and it's a simple one. You've got a hand of cards from 1 to 12, and one person starts the game with the boss cat token. Each person plays a card, and if that card is lower than the boss cat's card, then they get to score it as points. If a player plays the same card as the boss, then the boss doesn't score, and the other player does. So in this example, I'm the boss and I've played a 3. The person who played the 8 doesn't get to score the card, but the other two players do. Simple kids game, let's keep going. Path to Yaru won the award for excellence, and the founders of Ende won the award for Expert Game of the Year. What I failed to realize, though, is that these designers only showed up for one day of the convention. I made plans to see them on the second day, but the tables were gone. So let that be a lesson for you. Designers don't have to be at the convention every day. So that leaves us with our final game, Bob G10. This is the other game that won an award for excellence, and of course, the line for this game is huge. And this is where I'm going to state my one major complaint about the game market. What do you see when you get to the front of this line? It's the designers selling their game at their table, which is great, but is there any way for you to actually try out this game? No! That's because designers have basically two choices when showcasing their games here. They can have just a table to sell their game, or they can spend extra money and get a separate demo table where people can sit down and try out the game for themselves. So, do you want to try Bob G10? Well, too bad, you can't. How about Sashi and Sashi's new game? Too bad, you can't. How about this guy's game? Sorry, you're out of luck. What about this guy over here? Well, you're out of luck, too. Modeus Games? Oh, they paid the extra money. These people? Yep, they did it, too. Hey, remember that time I showed you Tokyo Highway? Well, they were actually doing their best to demo two games at their table because there wasn't anywhere else to do it. Now, don't get me wrong here. I'm not mad at the designers or even the hardworking people making this convention possible but I think there has to be a better way to do this. This is a show for board games, and to deny so many designers a separate demo table, even a small one, seems inappropriate. Oh, real quick, Sashi and Sashi's new game, Blend Coffee Lab. I didn't get to play it at the convention because, as I said, no demo table, but I did try it later. 
It's a trick-taking game that seems like a thematic sequel to Coffee Roaster. The top two or three people who win the trick get to take cards that form coffee cups, which will score them points. I enjoyed it enough, but I'm still not sure where I stand on it. I'm going to need some more plays of the game, but hopefully other reviews will eventually come out. So, are you feeling that indie goodness inside? Let's take a look at a few more games. Milalis is a game that sports some awesome anime artwork, if that's your thing. In a way, it feels like the game Get Bit with character powers. You have a hand of nine cards. In the center of the table is a row of point cards with different amounts of points on each card. Every player chooses a card and flips it over at the same time. These cards are lined up from largest to smallest against the point cards. If you played a number that no one else did, you get to take the point cards where your number is placed. However, if you happen to play the same number as someone else, then you get nothing. Once all cards from your hand have been played, the game is over and the most points win. It's fairly simple, but the character powers really help to spice this game up a bit. Alright, from the same designer, Argoat is a game that sports the same style artwork, and it's the type of game that I really enjoy. The cards in the center of the table represent different locations, and at the beginning of the game, there aren't many places you can go. On your turn, you can move your character to these different locations and take the actions that each card provides. These actions might include taking crystals, teleporting to other places, or gaining one of the eight fragments of ancient knowledge needed to win the game. By the end of the game, the map becomes huge, and once a player has collected all eight fragments, they need to find which card holds the secret location of Eden. First player to Eden with all eight fragments wins the game. I thought this game was a blast because I like exploration, special powers, and there was a bit more negotiating than I would have expected. When players are on the same space as each other, they can copy each other's fragments or trade crystals or their item cards. I might be biased because I won the game and was given a piece of artwork as a prize, but this game definitely deserves a little attention and it would be great to see an English version. In the meantime, I'm told that English stickers do exist online and you can put them on the cards. Sadly though, I couldn't get a copy of this game because they were all sold out. Check this one out if you can, a fun game in a small box. Speaking of small boxes, have you noticed a trend with the game market? Look at all of these games. Notice anything similar? Japanese-made games aren't usually grandiose in nature, with miniatures or extravagant boards. That's why you're not going to see a lavish game win the Game of the Year award. My theory is that designers don't have much money to spend and need to make something big with as little as possible. Whatever the reason though, the game Fireworks caught my attention simply from the large box size alone. So I decided to go check this one out. And I'll tell you right now that of all the games I played over these two days, this one was the funniest. And as a side note, it's not even from Japan, but rather Taiwan. So you've got a bunch of tiles in the box, you flip them all over to their backside, pick up the dice barrel, and drop the dice into the tiles. It's silly, ridiculous, and charming. You can take as many tiles as the number rolled on the dice, but only the tiles that have been revealed. You add these tiles to your board to score points. The thing is, if none of the tiles flip over, or if you miss the box entirely, you get another chance by taking a card. These cards have you dropping the dice in the box in wacky and weird ways. It might seem easy enough to flip these tiles over, but you would be surprised at just how terrible I was at this game. Seriously. Anyway, it was a fun game, the scoring at the end was a little confusing, but it made me laugh, even when I failed miserably. Something most games can't do. Well, it's time to talk about Oink Games again, just like last year. The first thing you saw when you entered Game Market this year was the Oink Games booth, and it was the biggest one at the show. They were showcasing their new game this year called Troika. Now if you're not sitting down, grab a seat and let me explain how the game works, as it was explained to me. In a world where mankind has discovered a distant star with special crystals, a group of travelers are on a quest to combine these crystals in the correct way, making one of them the richest human in the universe. But now, at a time when least expected, our heroes have spent the last of their fuel getting to this planet. You will need to use the crystals to not only make you the wealthiest person alive, but as the fuel that is going to bring you back home. Prepare for Troika. So on your turn, you flip over a tile and then you can choose to take that tile or any other tile on the table. If you collect a set of three of the same numbers, then you can escape the planet. If you can collect a set of three sequential numbers, then the last number in that set are the crystal points you get. 
A person can call out Troika to end the round, or once all the tokens have been collected, the round ends. Oh boy, toast! Alright, I don't want to push this too far. This is not a bad game. It works perfectly fine and does exactly what it's supposed to do. But wow! This was the first time I have ever felt such a disconnect from theme and gameplay during an explanation. And the game is played over three rounds. Did I decide to go back to the same planet with the same amount of fuel? What was I thinking? Okay, yes, I'll stop there. In all honesty, I think this would make a great sit around the table while chatting and snacking sort of game. It's light with simple rules that just about anyone can pick up quickly. Maybe just ignore the theme. Oh, or even better, try to push the theme as hard as you can. You'll probably create some good laughs. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're almost there. The final game I got to play at Game Market, and it's the only game I purchased. It's called Tagidon, or Tangled Logic in English. This is a pure deduction game, which is one of my favorite genres. You have two sets of numbers from 0 to 9 in both red and blue colors. However, the fives are green. Each player secretly takes five tiles and lays them in sequential order. If you pick up two of the same number, like I did here, then you lay the red tile first, followed by the blue tile. The goal of the game is to figure out exactly what your opponent has, both the number and its color. Six cards are shown on the table with various questions. On your turn, you choose one of these cards to ask your opponent. If the card says, shared info, then both players have to answer the question. The first one to guess their opponent's tiles wins. However, in a three and four player game, you are trying to deduce the tiles that weren't taken. In other words, the tiles left remaining in the middle of the table. This game works at all player counts wonderfully, and each time I've played it, everyone always says, let's do it one more time. It's quick, fast to teach, comes in a small box, and yet it burns your brain in a way that I love. My only complaint is that the paper they give you to write on is a bit too small, but definitely grab this one if you're a fan of deduction. Like any convention, Tokyo Game Market is a lot of fun. The games are definitely eclectic to say the least, and while I don't think it's necessary to go for both days, if you do find yourself in Tokyo at this time of year, definitely go and check it out. I mean, where else are you going to be able to play Magic the Gathering against people while relaxing on tatami mats? While language can and always will be a barrier for a lot of people, you shouldn't let that stop you from coming. There are plenty of people that do speak English, and you will always find friendly faces somewhere. I could go on, but it's time to wrap up this video and also give a special announcement. So the second year of Game Market for me is done. I hope you guys liked what you saw. I showed about 10 of the some hundred odd games that were on display today. Time can only give you so much, right? And if you liked what you saw here, come check me out at a new website. It's called DokiDokiDice.com. It's a new pet project of mine. I'm trying to show these independent games that are being made here in Japan, as well as in other countries across Asia. So if you liked what you saw here today, come check me out again, DokiDokiDice.com. I hope to see you guys there. Until next time, have a good one. Bye-bye. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff, in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.